Good morning, everybody, and welcome in to the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. The bells on Old Main tell me that it is nine o'clock in Happy Valley. Welcome. We have a good program lined up for you today. We're going to talk with Jeremy Omard. He's the managing consultant for, at IBM Global Business Services. He has had a great career at IBM. We're also going to talk about his service in the Maryland Defense Force and also his service back to Penn State. As always, we want to know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. Go ahead and drop that information in the chat on Zoom or if you are watching us on Facebook Live. Good morning out there on Facebook. Tell us who you are and where you're watching from today. We'll be getting started in just one minute. You're watching the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I see Jeff Ballou watching in Washington, D.C. from the class of 1990 and John Scullin from Haverford. Welcome in. Good to see both of you. Jeff Ballou, a wonderful friend of the Alumni Association. Good to see your name on here this morning, my friend. We'll see each other soon as we start getting back together and people start coming back to University Park and Happy Valley for the traditional ways that Penn State just gather. I'm so looking forward to, to, that, to that day. I'm not sure if people have noticed the announcement last evening uh, but they have announced a modified schedule for Arts Fest. And so even Arts Fest is making a, an appearance in 2021 with 11 musical performances. I encourage everybody to Google search the Central Pennsylvania Festival of the Arts today and you can find out what, uh, what who's performing where and when and how you can get access to that, whether you're here in State College or you're watching on Facebook Live. I see Jamika Williams joining us from Los Angeles, an early morning out there, 6 a.m. Thank you for waking up for coffee hour. And Karen Finland, uh, an arts and architecture grad, right, watching right here in Happy Valley, class of 88. Roxanne Shields and Julian, our wonderful colleague over at World Campus, uh, Roxanne and great volunteer for the Penn State Alumni Association. Good to see you here. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, we're recording this session and closed captions are available for this event. You can find the information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. Well, today we're joined by Jeremy Omard. Jeremy is the managing consultant, uh, is a managing consultant in the managed services and cloud solutions practice at IBM Business Services. He has worked with commercial, state, and federal government agencies serving in both technical and operational roles. In 2013, in 2013, I'm getting messages that our video might not be on. Let me, let me try that. How is that looking for you, Jeff? In 2013, Jeremy graduated from Penn State with a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Information System, Minoring in Operations and Supply Chain Management. He's also an acting commander of the Maryland Defense Force, the 256th Cyber Defense Unit. The MDDF is a volunteer uniform military, state military agency established in the Maryland legislature in 1917. The unit's heritage and traditions trace back to the 17th century. Jeremy is also a leader here at Penn State with our um, African-American alumni organization in DC. He is the co-chair of the Black Alumni Reunion Committee and he is today's guest on Coffee Hour. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Omar to Coffee Hour. Jeremy, how are you this morning? First of all, to Paul, the Alumni Association, and to the countless people watching this uh, Coffee Hour, uh, thank you guys for joining in. I'm doing great. I'm caffeinated, got my early morning workout, so life's good right now. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you got, you're prepared for a wonderful conversation. We're looking forward to this. Uh, I'm looking in the background though, and I, I don't have any preparation for this, but uh, is there, are you a musician? What, what's the keyboard set up? <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhat of a quote unquote musical genius. So um, I've been playing the piano and the keyboard for most of my life, um, started playing classical and truly despised it. Um, so I really got into music again during middle school. I took a music class just for easy A and the professor really noticed that I was quickly able to grasp music theory, but it seems as though the uh, courses and the information wasn't really challenging to me. So he kind of just challenged me to do my own thing, uh, think outside of the box, start playing by air. Um, and that's when I truly enjoyed playing the piano and the keyboard, which has led me to play for a lot of the local bands in the DC area. Um, I've played a lot of intro music and opening music for events at Penn State Barron, such as their gala, some of their uh, coffee house uh, uh, poem series. Um, and even today, I still just do covers of random songs on the radio. So um, music is definitely something that helps to keep me grounded in a super hyper connective and busy world. Well, we're going to come back to that in just a second, because I'm always fascinated by, I mean, you're a scientist as well, right? You're an engineer. Uh, and uh, so the, the art and the science and the left and the right brain of, of all of that, uh, I'll probably bring that back up at some point uh, again. But let's, let's start at the beginning. How did you become a Penn State Nittany Lion? Yeah, so it was during the fall of 2009. I was really looking at various schools. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something technical with my life, whether it was becoming a computer engineer, a software engineer, uh, information systems. I just knew computers were what I liked at the end of the day. Uh, so I really looked at schools that had a strong comp sci or computer engineering focus. Um, ultimately, the, um, narrowed my choice between Howard University, uh, Maryland, which we won't talk about, uh, Penn State and Virginia Tech. Um, the final selection came between Virginia Tech and Penn State. And one day I decided to visit the Barron campus of Penn State because that was actually the campus I selected, uh, given the fact that they also offered the SAP certificate, which was um, something that Barron was the only campus to provide that. And IBM is a huge proponent of all things SAP. So it kind of just worked out later on in my career. Um, but I fell in love with both the Barron campus as well as just the general culture of Penn State in its entirety. Um, it also helps my favorite color is blue, so I'm, I might be somewhat biased to blue and white. Um, but I, I just felt at home at Penn State, um, whether it was Barron, whether it was at University Park, whether it was just touring the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and to this day, I think it's one of the best choices I've ever made because I've made some lifelong friends. Um, I really enjoyed what I've done both as an undergrad as well as an alumni leader. Um, and I wouldn't change that experience for anything else. Talk a little bit about that decision. I, I mean, when, when, when um, seniors are applying to Penn State, right? That they know about the two plus two program. They know about the extensive Commonwealth program. Uh, but you were you were really intentional about choosing Penn State Barron. Uh, talk about why maybe that campus spoke to you more than more than some others that might have been closer to home or might have been, you know, I mean, people talk about the draw that University Park has, but it sounds like the echoes on the campus of Penn State Barron really spoke to you when you were there. Yeah, it was almost a game of camp campus roulette, for lack of better words. Um, one thing that automatically attracted me to Barron was the fact that the full name is Penn State Airy, the Barron College. So I heard Airy, I thought it was spooky. Um, for some reason, it just like resonated in my mind. So I was just like, hmm, that's an interesting name. Um, always knew about University Park, but um, what just kind of interested me about Penn State in general was the true Penn, Penn State system versus, say, um, Maryland that has the University of Maryland system, but each school is an independent school, um, whereas Penn State, each campus is Penn State. Um, so that made that choice relatively easy. Um, I did some independent research about Barron. Um, they really focused on engineering and business. Um, so it kind of just worked out in my favor that I kind of just selected Barron just because of the name. And um, here we are today in 2021 and everything has worked out. So um, I'm a firm believer believer of things happen for a reason and um, it just seemed to work to my advantage at the end of the day. I think that's one of the beautiful things about Penn State, right? If you want the, the, the large um, 
land grant uh, college experience, right? And be on a campus with 45,000 other students, you know, we have that. If you want to be on a campus with five to 8,000 students, right? And complete a four year degree there, we have that. If you want to start maybe someplace closer to home um, and, and then go off to uh, the larger, a larger campus, we have that. If, if you can't come to Pennsylvania and you still want to be a Penn Stater, you can study through the world campus. And so um, Penn State means so many different things to so many different people. And I think uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people can find their home at Penn State. So I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about our institution that differentiates us from um, some of the other institutions that you considered. Uh, I know uh, you probably think back and regret um, even putting Maryland on that list. Uh, when you came to Penn State, you immediately got involved, uh, not only academically, but you were involved outside of the cl classroom as a student leader. Talk about some of the things you were involved in as a student at Penn State. Yes, yeah, so I think that's something that's just stemmed through the earlier uh, phase of my life where I was just always active in leadership roles for organizations. Um, literally within my first two years at Barron, um, got heavily involved in NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, our Multicultural Council, um, where I took leadership positions as the vice president for both uh, organizations. And then I ultimately served as the treasurer for the Multicultural Council as well. Um, got heavily involved in Delta Chi fraternity serving as their vice president. So um, also got involved in Greek life at Barron. Um, and then I also was involved heavily in mentoring. Um, I'm a firm believer of paying it forward. So um, some of the advisors reached out to me and asked if I wanted to get in, uh, involved in the Fast Start program. Um, and they kind of gave me a spiel what Fast Start intends, uh, some of their goals, their missions, things of that nature. Uh, I figured why not? It, when you first come into a university, no matter how large or small it is, um, you always have questions. You always want to make sure that you're making the right choices. Uh, so being able to kind of provide my perspective to uh, freshmen and kind of help them navigate the murky waters of academia uh, was something that interested me. And it was a mutually beneficial experience. And that's one reason why I'm a strong proponent of mentoring to this day, because I learned just as much as from my mentees um, that they learned from me as a mentor as well. So. I think by giving back and kind of sharing your knowledge, but also being open to feedback, constructive criticism, and just someone else's experience, that really allows you to grow as an individual, a practitioner, um, and just better yourself at the end of the day. You were also really involved with Thon uh, at Penn State Barron. What are some of your memories from either student leadership opportunities or, or your involvement with Thon while you were there? Yeah, so I think the two biggest things that I remember from my Thon experience were the first time I went Canon, which was awesome. Um, it was in Aerie. And then the first time I went to University Park for Big Thon. Um, and it, it was kind of weird because literally days before we made the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, for lack of better words, <laughs> I actually felt really sick. Um, I don't know what it was. I think I had a cold. And literally the day I arrived upon campus and I walked into the BJC and just saw the energy of everyone else, like, it was like I got my second wind of life. The world magically opened up. The sky was shining. I just felt better. And it really shows just the power of Penn State. Um, oftentimes people think we're a big football school or even a big party school. But to be involved in something that's bigger than yourself, to give back um, the largest student-ran philanthropic event, uh, it was just amazing to be in the presence of other like-minded students, faculty, alumni who really just wanted to do something for the children. Um, so it, it, was, it was awesome. And uh, it, it's definitely one of the things that I really enjoyed being a Penn Stater and being able to say that I worked on something that gave back and ultimately provided um, meaningful services to people who needed it the most. Yeah, and we've already touched on early in our conversation Two must do's if you're a Penn Stater, right? You must go to the Bryce Jordan Center um, and and feel the energy of Thon. But but probably lesser known than that, if you have the opportunity to visit our Barron campus, take that opportunity. Go to the the highest point on campus, climb that hill, which is I know uh, students dread having to climb that hill for, for class. But but then turn around and take a look back out on Lake Erie. It's one of our uh, all of our campuses are beautiful, but it's one of the most uh, scenic places in, in the Penn State system. And so if you have a chance to 
tour our Barron campus, make sure you take the opportunity to do that. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined this morning by Jeremy Omar. Jeremy is a managing consultant uh, with IBM Global Business Services. Services. He's also a 2021 recipient of the Alumni Achievement Award. We're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But first, walk us through your professional career after graduating from Penn State with your MIS degree. Uh, it was almost a, a, it was a connection that even began as a student that launched your career with IBM. Yeah, so Paul, the timing for this is perfect because I'm actually kind of celebrating the anniversary of the first internship I landed with IBM, but my IBM journey uh, actually starts before even the internship. Uh, so fast forward to 2011, uh, Penn State Barron and IBM had a co-op uh, opportunity. So I got involved in that program, um, traveled to DC, picked up my IBM laptop and my IBM badge, things were awesome. But it was the first time that the DC area has done a, a co-op with Barron. So it was kind of weird trying to figure out, okay, well, he's a student, so could we assign him work, things of that nature and kind of iron out um, what my job responsibilities would be. So I really just sat there and attended meetings and kind of dreaded my experience. Uh, so one day during one of our communication classes, almost as a joke, um, the professor asked us to um, submit some of the internships that we were looking at to the portal just to show that we were diligently working on looking for internships. Uh, so I actually went to an internal IBM portal and applied for an internal internship um, just to satisfy that requirement. Um, Fast forward to June of 2011, uh, found out that I actually did get the internship. Um, and that set, set internship led me to a full-time opportunity contingent upon my graduation uh, from Penn State um, at IBM, where I've been able to grow as a practitioner. Um, and I've been promoted across the ranks. I've worked on a variety of projects, both internally as well as externally. Um, and it's really kind of shaped my IBM journey um, starting full-time in 2013, my first project, uh, I was involved in application testing for the Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, fast forward to 2021, I'm currently a system engineer for the Defense Commissary Agency, where we're in charge for uh, securing, installing, and configuring a lot of the hardware and software solutions used at each commissary throughout the DOD's footprint, which is truly global. Um, so it's awesome because I truly get to travel, visit my client sites, make sure that things are actually done in according to specs and regulation. Um, and I can see in real time the benefit that we add to our client because they're in the stores with us, making sure that everything's working. When their st stores go live and they're able to run transactions and things of that nature, you can just see the like energy that's radiating across their face that they have a solution that works, that's secure, that actually does what the solution's intended to do. Um, and that's one thing that I like about consulting because you really get to foster relationship with your clients. Uh, you understand their pain points. And at the end of the day, if you're truly good at what you do, you're able to provide them with recommendations that address their key issues and allow them to succeed in their mission. You know, I'm always interested in, in organizational culture. I'm interested in kind of the history of an organization. And, and IBM is a fascinating one to me, right? Founded in 1911 um, in the technology space, right? Probably the space that has changed uh, most and quicker than any other industry uh, here over the last 110 years. How do, what would you attribute IBM survival to over that 110 year period? So I think the biggest thing is IBM's ability to reinvent itself um their first product was the punch card and looking at fast forward into the year 2021 everyone's like what's a punch card um but it shows that as technology grows in order to succeed in the business world you need to adapt overcome and improve upon your business processes your core offerings and your solutions um and ibm went from building punch cards to being the leader in quantum computing artificial intelligence uh security and hybrid cloud um so it shows that in order to survive in an ever-changing digital world, you need to continue to grow. You need to reinvest in your practitioners. And that's probably what's kept me at IBM throughout the years is the fact that I've really had a supportive management team. Uh, if I said, hey, I want to study Y and Z, um, they would make it work. They would find some way to get funding for my training, funding for my certification, um, allow me to study at my leisure, things of that nature, so that I can continue to grow as a practitioner. Uh, because one thing IBM is really good at is the fact that 
as long as their practitioners continue to grow, then they're able to grow because IBM's greatest invention is the IBMer. Um, so having that flexibility, that leeway to really chart my own career path and kind of focus on what I want to focus on is something that's really kept me at IBM since, well, full time since 2013. I was I was expecting that. I knew I'm, I, I we've known each other for a couple of years now, but you're you're kind of on the clock at IBM right now. So I was expecting the the crisp white shirt with the button down and the blue co- and the blue tie, uh, kind of the the stereotypical right 1970s 1980s uh, vision that we have of IBMers. But but that has also evolved uh, over the years to. Um, to almost connote, uh, you know, innovation, if you will. Actually, Paul, you brought up a good point, and we we joke about that even in the office. Um, the IBM legacy brand focuses on the consultants wearing their blue suits with their white shirts and their blue ties. Um, and nowadays, if you're on a client site, some of those legacy things kind of still exist. Not necessarily the blue suit, but a suit. Um, but IBM has really adopted. Um, true 21st uh, century norms. Um, in the office, we actually have a lot of offices where the dress code is quote unquote smart casual. So you can wear jeans and a polo, um, button up things of that nature. Um, so IBM has really continues to not only reinvent its service offerings, but its culture at the end of the day as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then look, that's, that's a way that they've evolved over the years, right? Especially with the tech boom and being able to wear shorts and flip flops to your to your tech startup, right? They were they were in the same space of competing for that talent, right? And so, um, in order to compete, they they had to adjust a little bit, not compromise, right? But but adjust on um, what it means to be an IBM or over the years. Absolutely. So, service is a big part of your life, and and really probably the central theme of our conversation today. Um, I still want to stay at IBM. You serve at work in roles that are beyond your job description. Tell us a little bit about the Give initiative at IBM and your involvement in longevity. Yes, yeah, so Give is the global initiative to volunteer experience. Uh, so it was the first nonprofit work that I got involved with at IBM. Um, one thing that kind of stood out to me about Give is the fact that you get to leverage your God-given talent to help a nonprofit that's really working on uh, issue that addresses uh, humanity at the end of the day. Uh, so I uh, enrolled in the GIVE program. I got assigned to Longevity, who focuses on eradicating all things associated with lung cancer, um, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm very anti-cancer, I've supported um, the Avon 39 Breast Cancer Walk, uh, Susan G. Komen initiatives and things of that nature as well. Um, but really, they looked for practitioners who can help them to revamp their donor strategy, uh, some of the technical offerings that the longevity team at the New York office can use to kind of better collaborate with donors and their internal team and things of that nature. And it was nice to kind of put my traditional project work to the side, think outside of the box, understand their pain point, understand how the typical donor process is initiated and suggest improvements to facilitate a smoother transaction at the end of the day. Um, because a lot of times nonprofits may not have access or the skip of the in-house skill to adopt some of these technical solutions. So being able to kind of hold their hand, provide them with guidance and best practices was something that was um, really welcomed when I was able to get involved with that project. So you're also involved um, with an employee-led group called Black at IBM. Talk a little bit about, about that group and what the role and purpose is of that and how you help fellow IBMers. Right. So IBM being involved in corporate social responsibility, uh, each major metropolitan area has what's known as a business resource group, um, which really focuses on um, various uh, demographics and things of that nature. So being Black in the D.C. area, I joined the Black uh, Consultant Constituency, um, which has since then changed to the Black BRG of D.C. And um, it's one of those things where names change every couple of years. Uh, but the real emphasis was to help Black practitioners grow as consultants, as practitioners, um, and then two, to leverage the IBM brand, the IBM technology, the IBM legacy, 
to kind of push social change and social justice. Uh, so one of the biggest projects that I've got involved with um, are one call for code, which leverages IBM's technical capabilities and capacity to address real world issues. Uh, my team worked on a social justice program where we developed a proof of concept that for our integrated database that uh, ingested suppression order data so that um, lawyers were able to kind of see what uh, information was suppressed from uh, the court and be able to leverage that information when defending clients who were convicted of wrongdoings that really didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool to really work on a social justice um, project um, on IBM's dime. And then we also focused on the Embrace strategy, which really focused on addressing social and societal issues within corporate America as well. Uh, so we worked on various frameworks to not only promote, but to also kind of allow practitioners from all walks of life to feel comfortable being who they are in corporate America, to identify them with mentors who shared some of their um, same characteristics, whether it's being born, born abroad, whether it's um, speaking multiple languages, um, whether it's feeling as though you're a minority in a major uh, organization and you just don't know where to go. Um, we really focus on address, addressing those societal needs within the corporate uh, or the corporate culture. Um, and that was probably one of my most meaningful um, initiatives that I got to work on being a part of Black at IBM. Jeremy, any parallels between the work at Black at IBM and kind of Penn State's history of, um, you know, striving to be um, more a more diverse institution to be equitable. Um, what what parallels might might you draw between the work that you're doing with that resource group um, and kind of your perception of Penn State as an alumnus in this space? Yes. Yeah, so Penn State being the international. Union uh, organization and IBM being an international company, um, there were definitely some parallels that I saw right off the bat. Um, first of all, the majority of the population in senior leadership is white and male, similar to Penn State. Um, two, there are a lot of uh, minority uh, groups within the Penn State ecosystem as well as the IBM ecosystem, so I saw that connection. Uh, three, there are a lot of Penn Staters who work at IBM, so I saw that uh, connection as well and have reached out to some notable Penn State alumni who are in um, leadership roles at IBM. And I think one thing that I learned from both my time at Penn State as well as my time being a leader of an organization within the Alumni Association was how to foster those relationships, how to have meaningful conversations regarding race, um, kind of how to shape a mentoring program that Tailor, that was tailored to the needs of those involved in the program and trying to identify what issues or what support that uh, consultants of color may need based on some of my experience that I had as a student at Penn State. Um, it's, it's interesting because I also talk to this when I'm doing university recruiting events. A lot of the skills, the techniques, the technologies that you learn in academia really do apply to the business world. Um, my thing when I'm doing university recruitment is to kind of tie in how those senior lecture labs that you had really do play a role in the type of work that you're going to work in a major organization or a corporation. Um, but it was also nice to see some of the organizational skills that I learned as a student leader being applied in the business world as well. Um, so I think Penn State really gave me a sandbox where I can kind of hone my skills, my techniques, procedures, and really apply them in a real business world situation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that and about kind of what's being done at Penn State to address um, racial issues uh, to make sure that it is a, you know, that it is a, a Penn State experience for all, right? We've taken some great strides uh, over the years to make sure that that is the case, but admittedly, there's still a long way to go, right? We, we see We see opportunities to improve. That's why we have um, the task force on on climate and uh, and that that's working towards um, racial and social equity here at Penn State. You've seen the journey that IBM has been on. Uh, we'll we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, you know in addition to your professional life, which look I'd be exhausted 
at the end of the day, if, if that's all that I had to do with what we just talked about in the opening part of our conversation. But you also, um, for the past 11 years, uh, you have served the Maryland Defense Force um, and have climbed through the ranks of, of that organization. For those who aren't familiar with the Maryland Defense Force and the type of military organization that is, can you share a little bit more about that and its purpose? Yeah, absolutely. So each state um, and technically U.S. territory is allowed to or is authorized to have a state defense force. Some states call them a state guard, a state military reserve. Um, there are multiple names, but the most common name is a state defense force. Uh, so the history of the Maryland Defense Force goes back to the 17th century, well before there was an established National Guard or state defense force. Um, it was essentially the colonial militia that protected a uh, given colony. Uh, fast forward to World War I, when the National Guard finally was able to become federalized and sent overseas, state leadership really noted that there was a void that was being left in their given states because National Guard resources were being deployed to conflict zones. Um, and that left state critical infrastructure such as dams, the electrical grid, um, hospitals and armories vacated. Um, so the states uh, were able to stand up what is known as state defense forces, which backfilled and in some cases serve to complement or serve as a force multiplier to their National Guard counterparts and really protect the state's critical infrastructure. Um, the mission of state defense forces has changed as the mission of the military in general has changed over the course of the last decades. Um, but most recently, state defense forces are tasked with augmenting their National Guard counterparts and technical professional um, roles as well as in manpower um, support as well. Um, Maryland being one of the major hubs for all things uh, information security, cyber sec security, and intelligence, um, we are really strong in our cyber branch. Um, so my experience with the Defense Force started back 11 years ago when I was enlisted. Um, I was a 25 Bravo, so IT specialist, and that's really how I got my early technical skills, um, which I was able to apply when working at the uh, IT service desk at Penn State. Um, it was nice because I noticed that if you're in a, any type of technical or help desk role, if you're really good at what you do, people will come and seek you out and treat you as a quote unquote God because you know how to solve their problems as even if it's the most routine problem. Um, but as I continue to grow as a student, as a practitioner, um, as a soldier, I ventured off into cybersecurity it was something that always interested me um, because being able to defend and against attacks and being able to secure systems was just something that I always liked because um, I'm somewhat mischievous. I also like to break things. So by being able to secure things, um, you get two unique different perspectives. Um, join the cyber defense unit um, originally as their operations officer because um, as an officer, I served as an aide de camp. I've served um, in planning roles. I've served on the Maryland National Guard Joint Staff. Um, so I was really great at planning um, military operations. Um, then when our commanding officer at the time needed someone to take over training and planning initiatives, because I had that experience at IBM, I served as the planning chief and the training chief. Um, and then when the commander at the time decided to step down, um, given the fact that he knew that one, I was a valued consultant at IBM. Two, I had a lot of those key relationships with the Maryland Military Department. Um, and three, I've been deployed in a variety of, uh, on a variety of missions in support of the Maryland National Guard. Uh, he couldn't think of a better person to recommend for the commander billet. Um, the commanding general of the Maryland Defense Force signed off on it, and I became the, command, the commanding officer for the 256 Cyber Defense Unit. Um, my biggest initiatives have been to kind of focus on not only working with our state partners to secure the state, but to kind of reflect and look internally on how we can better secure our organization as well. Um, oftentimes, because state defense forces are used as a force multiplier, um, they're ready to just charge into battle and support their National Guard counterparts. Um, but it, it's simple as any type of blitz type of strategy. If you're always forward deploying, if you're always forward moving, uh, you kind of leave your rear and your sides open to being flanked. So I figured, hey, let's take a tactical pause. Let's look at how we can also secure our organization as well, because we can't support our big brother, uh, the National Guard and our state counterparts, if we don't kind of look at our hygiene and take care of our house as well. So I've implemented a lot of policy strategies um, and technical safeguards to defend our organization as well. 
Um, and as I continue to grow as a officer and as a cyber practitioner, um, my goal is to kind of share some of those lessons learned, those best practices with other state organizations, as well as other state defense forces. Um, my unit's actually in the process of uh, hosting a seminar at the State Guard Association of the U.S.'s annual conference with some other cyber leaders at the various state guards across the country. Um, so we have a lot of cyber related courses that we want to train or present uh, to those uh, conference attendees so that they can secure their state and their organization at the end of the day. You know, it's interesting. I think when people think of military and they think of defense, right, our mind naturally is drawn to the, the latest weapon system or a new battleship or, a, you know, a, a new uh, fighter jet. But we, we often forget kind of the invisible battleground, uh, battlefield that, um, that we are constantly day to day, hour to hour, minute by minute, kind of defending ourselves from from attacks, I think, um, you know, I think of the technology that is used on the modern battlefield, whether it's communications, whether it's GPS, um, but there's also the defense against cyber, cyber attacks. Talk a little bit about how um, those attacks are just as dangerous potentially to national security as, uh, as a weapon system might be. Yeah, absolutely. The unique thing about cyber related attacks is that they can have an economic impact and they could also impact quality of life. Um, a good example is in the UK, um, there were actually incidents where because first responders weren't able to find out where to go to kind of provide medical aid to um, those in need, um, there was at least one known case where unfortunately someone did pass away due to the fact that um, ransomware impacted that organization's ability to provide life-saving services uh, to someone in need. So um, that's a real-world example of how cyber can be leveraged to take a life. Um, but even from an economic uh, impact, you could look at the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, which basically shut down gas production uh, on the U.S. East Coast, which caused built millions of billions of dollars in damage in a short period of time. It caused oil to be have to be shipped from uh, barges and ships versus leverage in the pipeline, which also contribute contributed to a supply chain crisis as well. Um, so cyber is something that uh, can take place anywhere in the world. Uh, it really doesn't need to be delivered via a plane, the submarines, whereas nuclear missiles have to be uh, leveraged from some type of um, delivery system. And it really does have the impact to both target civilians as well as um, states and government organizations as well. And the thing about cyber is everyone's at risk. A lot of people like to say that they're not at risk, um, but there are different levels of cyber crime. There are crimes of opportunities where an attacker may literally just try and attack against a random group of people just to see who's most susceptible to the attack. And if they get in, they get in and um, they've done their damage. Then you have the advanced persistent threat who are really looking to uh, seek um, so chaos throughout like government organizations, military organizations, and to really attack another nation state. Um, and then even at the corporate level, you have corporate espionage, espionage which is huge as well. Um, so the type of attacks that may be levied really depend on the individual's threat profile. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't really factor in. They think because they're the average citizen, they may not be uh, susceptible to attack or attacker may not really have any reason to attack them. Um, but sometimes it's someone who's literally learning about cyber security who wants to try the latest and greatest attack and they're just gonna find some random person um, and by the luck of the draw, you could become a victim. Before we move on to uh, your Penn State service um, as, as an alumnus, we got some questions coming in that I wanna touch on. Uh, uh, questions about IBM. So uh, essentially this question is what's next for IBM? How is IBM continuing to change to keep up with consumer demand, consumer need, kind of what's on the horizon technologically that, that you're looking at? Absolutely. So some of our major offerings that we're looking at to kind of shape our strategic imperative in the future are AI, um, 
a lot of people are familiar with IBM Watson, um, which was used in all types of use cases, whether it was to do cancer research, whether it was to win Jeopardy. Um, so it just shows how flexible AI can be used to really address real world issues. And IBM is continuing to invest in AI solutions um, to address a variety of needs, whether it's to look at security related is issues and to auto remediate said issues, or whether it's to aid in med medicine related research. Uh, quantum computing is huge as well, whether it's gonna be used to crack um, our adversaries encryption algorithms or whether it's used to kind of speed up the time um, to research various strands of viruses and things of that nature. Um, but there's also a strong push with IBM to focus on the hybrid cloud approach. Um, so you have major players in the cloud market, such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, um, even the Google Cloud Platform, which are really great at kind of providing their offerings. Um, IBM's kind of trying to take a different approach. They realize that vendor lock-in is going to happen based on an organizational's risk appetite, some of the legacy contracts that they have in place and things of that nature. Um, but an organization may want to leverage, say, Microsoft Azure because they have a Microsoft Active Directory or they've used Microsoft products for the entirety of their organization's life. But then they may want to stand up, say, a web server using Amazon Web Services because it may be the cheapest solution, but provide high quality uh, characteristics as well. Um, so IBM's trying to position itself as the hybrid cloud leader and to kind of say, OK, these are the various offerings that cloud um, service provider A has, and this is what cloud service provider B has, and this is how we can integrate the best of both organizations to provide you with a unique uh, capability or a unique uh, set of tools to support your organization's mission at the end of the day. Um, so we're really pivoting ourselves to become the hybrid cloud leader and to an adopt approach where if you want to have a private cloud and a public cloud, hey, we can help you integrate those services. If you want to have your database hosted in your data center halfway across the world, but you want to use Amazon Web Services for your web server, we can make them talk to each other and stand up an application for you. Um, we're really trying to look at unique ways uh, to provide value add service to our constituents at the end of the day. Another question coming in, I'm gonna ask it a little differently, um, but it's talking about um, cyber defense, right? And when I hear cyber defense, I think about it in the sports connotation, right? There's an offense and there's a defense. So my, my question to you is, who's winning the game? Is it the attackers? Are the attackers being more innovative right now? And um, those who are on the offensive to try to get into systems? That are, that, that are kind of making the most gains? Or is it those on the defense side, right? Where is, where is the most innovation happening and kind of who's winning the battle on the cyber attacks? So the information domain is an interesting domain for lack of better words, just because of the fact that a defender has to defend against every threat known to man, an attacker just has to get lucky and get access to a system once. Um, so you look at, if you look at it from that perspective, the attacker typically has the advantage. Um, but what, one thing that I've noticed, at least with certain industries, is the fact that uh, defense mechanisms really are um, improving. Oftentimes, most of the major cyber attacks or breaches that are on the news actually aren't because of major sophisticated technical attacks. It's actually because of the human aspect of business and cybersecurity and all things uh, computer related. And, um, I remember I was doing some research and even last year, 90% of all attacks leveraged email, for example. Um, so attackers are leveraging some of the most basic tools to compromise organizations. Um, and I have this conversation with a lot of my clients Sometimes they think they're safe because they just purchased the most expensive flashy block box. Um, that's all fine and dandy if you're if the threat that you're trying to safeguard relies on that technology. Um, but if you're not doing the bare minimum to kind of address the digital hygiene perspective, if you're not empowering your employees to report security in incidents, if you're not telling your employees about the importance of password best practices and enrolling in two-factor authentication, uh, oftentimes attackers of all skill levels are just gonna leverage the most simplest attack methods to compromise organization. Um, so I think it's not necessarily 
who's winning it's more so what we really need to focus on um you can easily make the argument that security tools and solutions are outstanding uh they work nine times out of ten um but if i don't need to disable your alarm to get into your house if you left your house open then um that really kind of um diffuses the situation in its entirety so we kind of have to reshape the dialogue from is the technology working to are we really looking at this at a whole, from a holistic perspective? Are we work, focusing on the people processes, um, the SOPs, the technology? Are we looking at it as a whole to address the security um, issues at the end of the day? And I think that's where we as a society are probably at our weakest. We're really good with the technology, um, but humans remain the weakest link in the security triad. Absolutely. Well, look, I want to get to your involvement with Penn State uh, because that's uh, we're, we're so grateful for all that you continue to do for for dear old state. Um, you're active with the alumni of the African American Alumni Organization of DC and um, held a variety of leadership roles there. Talk about the work of the AAAOs. Yeah, so I, I've really enjoyed my tenure with AAAO. Uh, I started as the treasurer and have been the president for the last three going on four years now. So it's definitely been an amazing experience and journey. Um, I think one thing that I'm actually really happy at our ability to kind of adapt and overcome was um, we were always known for social and in-person events. And with the pandemic, when the pandemic first kicked off um, and kind of eliminated our abilities to have in-person events, um, we reached out to some of the other organizations such as AAAO Philly. We reached out to some of our local chapters such as the Washington, Metropolitan uh, Washington chapter of DC, uh, SMEO DC and the Professional Women's Network of DC, um, as well as some of the other AAAOs to kind of figure out how we can tailor our programs from an in-person approach to a virtual approach. Um, we were able to do some pretty unique things. I know we kicked off multiple happy hours before Zoom happy hours were truly a thing, um, where we've had attendance, um, attendance up to about like 50 people. We had a DJ kind of facilitate the happy hour before Instagram started shutting down music, DJ uh, led uh, Instagram live sessions. So we were kind of able to adapt, overcome, think outside of the box and really come up with some creative offerings for our membership. Um, I think the one thing that I'm really proud of in 2021 was the fact that we reached out to AAAO Philly, uh, we reached out to the folks of the Black Alumni Reunion, and we really kind of focused on having a campus climate conversation where we talked about some of the racial disparities conspiracies that are happening at Penn State. Um, we had representation from the Alumni Association. We had student representation from those who were actually impacted by some of the issues at state. Um, we had a prominent alumni speak, and we also had folks from the various task forces also provide updates with what Penn State is doing to address racial issues um, at the university. And I think that was awesome because it really brought alumni from all walks of life, all decades together to really understand how we can move from the, the wrongs of the past and really look at a brighter future for our students because um, students truly are the future of not just Penn State, but our world. Um, and we need to kind of promptly eliminate a lot of those legacy racial disparities that have been typically leveraged against students of color at the university. So I think we've made some strong movements. Um, there's a lot that can still be done. And I know, Paul, you said you would speak about this later on. Um, but I think we're at least starting to move in the right direction. Um, and I hope that we continue to have that positive momentum to, at the end of the day, if not eradicate, to severely eliminate some of the prejudice that does take place at the university. Yeah, I, I think of some of the things that we have done uh, from an alumni association perspective. And none of this is said to pat ourselves on the back, but to, to talk about maybe the foundation that we have set for future work in this space. But um, with our new strategic plan that starts July 1 and having diversity, equity, and inclusion as a one of the one of the four pillars of that, uh, there's gonna be a lot of a lot of work and effort put into making sure that Penn Staters feel the sense of belonging that all Penn Staters need to feel um, when, they're, when they're part of a community. And, and a lot of that starts with kind of the co-design of those engagement experiences, right? It's, it's why we um, work in partnership with the AAAOs 
and with the Black Alumni Reunion, right? It's not us kind of sitting here trying to design um, an engagement opportunity that we hope people will participate in, but it's really a co-designed effort, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's working with uh, members of, of all of our communities to make sure that we are, uh, that we're in this together and that we're listening and that we are designing meaningful experiences for all Penn Staters to participate in. It, it's about diversifying our volunteer opportunities uh, with alumni council, not just um, to be representative, but to gain critical mass so that the conversations actually change on those boards. So it's not about having all of your populations represented, right? That's like step one, but it's taking it to the next level so that the actual focus and conversation of the organizations change. And, and look, Black Alumni Reunion, AAAOs have been a big part of helping the Alumni Association move in that direction. Um, you talked about the impact of those two organizations um, and, and the focus on students. I know Black Alumni Reunion uh, has always had a student component to that. Can you talk a little bit more about the student interaction piece between, uh, between BAR and, and current students? Absolutely. So we've leveraged various techniques to kind of foster a relationship with the student. Um, for example, during the 2018 Black Alumni Reunion, we went to a lot of the student-led events to kind of just so, uh, organically show our support uh, for those student-led initiatives. Uh, we also co-hosted the Ice Cream Social where we invited the students. We had conversations with the students, kind of shared um, both our Penn State experience as well as some of the lessons that we learned um, post-grad with the students as well. Um, and currently we're reaching out to a lot of the student-led organizations to kind of figure out different ways in which uh, one, as alumni, we could still continue to get involved uh, and support our students at the end of the day. And two, uh, how we could also add students to become a major player within future Black alumni reunions as well, because to become a Black alumni, you have to graduate from Penn State. So we need to make sure that our students are graduating from Penn State, um, that Penn State's retaining Black students, um, and that students feel welcomed after graduating because oftentimes a lot of Black uh, alumni who, are, who have recently graduated have reached out to us. And they oftentimes note that sometimes they just don't know where to go or how to kind of re-foster that relationship with the university. Um, so we're trying to be proactive instead of reactive. So Jeremy, for all that we have talked about today, you have been nominated by Penn State Behrend for the Alumni Achievement Award and have been selected uh, as a 2021 recipient of that award. What does that recognition by your alma mater mean to you? You know, it was actually pretty surreal. I remember getting a uh, call from the Chancellor of Penn State Behrend, Chancellor Ford, um, and I, I didn't know what to expect because I didn't even know I got the award. So when I saw his number on my phone, I was like, um, what's going on? So we had a nice conversation, um, just playing catch up with all things uh, life, Penn State and things of that nature. Uh, and then he broke the news that I received the award. So I was just like, yeah. um, I didn't even know that I was in the running for the award. And I'm someone who really doesn't necessarily, some people have to kind of bring up their accomplishments all the time. I do a lot and really don't care about the awards. I know they're nice to have and I do enjoy getting said awards, um, but I've never been the type of person to say, hey, I'm the greatest person of all time because I have X, Y, and Z. That's just not how I operate. Uh, so when I even found out that I was um, accepted for the award amongst uh, some other not notable alumni who were also selected, um, it was just a truly humbling experience because um, I do what I do just because I like doing what I do and not because I'm ex I expect an award out of it. Um, so it was kind of nice to, for me to kind of hear, hey, we appreciate everything that you've done for the university and um, we'd like to add you as one of the recipients of the award. Um, definitely made my day when I found out that information. Well, it is, it is well-deserved and we look forward to having you on campus uh, to present that award, uh, to present that award soon. We like to have a little bit of fun here on the coffee hour. We call it our lightning round. So I'm going to throw a couple of quick questions at you and you tell us, um, you tell us what, what pops to mind. Your favorite class at Penn State? I'm going to say 
it's a tough two between my systems analysis class, RAMIS, um, and my web design class with Dr. Nelson Barron. Um, she's a professor who I've established a very great professional relationship with over the uh, course of my tenure. And a lot of the design uh, techniques that I learned for, in her class are stuff that I apply when I'm doing freelance consulting work as well. Um, so I would definitely say system analysis and website design. How about if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? <laughs> so someone asked me this at work and I would say probably Leonardo DiCaprio because I feel like he's a great partier and I feel as though um, based off of Wolf of Wall Street because me and my friends used to joke and say we were the wolves of DC. Um, I feel as though we'd have some interesting conversations. Oh, that would be that would be an interesting that that might be a movie in and of itself. Like exactly. a night out with Jeremy and Leo. <laughs> um, how about your most unusual we are moment? You've talked about your travel with IBM, you talked about all the Penn Staters at IBM. Where have you heard the we are that's maybe caught you off guard a little bit? Twice in the Philippines. So the first time was actually the Penn State versus Ohio State game that we don't want to talk about. Um I was actually watching the game in a meeting and I just slammed my phone down. And then I heard some lady in the back of the room just like let out the deepest sigh. I looked back and I realized we're both Penn Staters and we both graduated at the same time and we both work for IBM. So we became really good friends after that. Um, and we used to just yell out, we are in the most random times while in the Philippines. Um, the second time was when I was hiking the tall volcano uh, and I saw a Filipino man with a Penn State shirt and I just yelled out, we are, and he was like, Penn State. And I was just like, did that just happen in the Philippines? Um, so definitely those two experiences. That's amazing. How about your favorite Penn State sport? I feel like it's biased. I'm going to have to say football, but honorable mention to the women's volleyball and Penn State wrestling. Um, one, the women's volleyball team is just amazing. Like yeah. same with the wrestling team. Um, but as someone who practices jujitsu, and I kind of wish my high school had started wrestling prior to my senior year because I was involved in baseball and ROTC. Um, wrestling is something I probably would have picked up. So it's nice to see just how dominant Penn State is in wrestling. And your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? <sighs> you know, now it's alumni swirl. I think once upon a time it was Peachy Paterno, but there is just something about being alumni getting an alumni swirl, having a little bit of chocolate added to it, but I think it's still a nice swirl. All right. Well, Jeremy, we want to thank you for joining us on Coffee Hour this morning. Um, it's alumni like you that allow us to share your story that raises the value of every Penn State degree, and we're truly grateful for that. Thanks for all you do to continue to live a life of impact as a Penn Stater. No, thanks for having me. And this was fun. So I definitely enjoyed the experience and uh, look forward to connecting with everyone in person uh, sooner than later. Uh, we will get together soon. Don't you worry about that. I want to thank everyone for joining us on Coffee Hour. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, go to our website today at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State.